Right, so uh, let's begin. Um, I'm going to uh, take care of your OP244. Um, um, and uh, uh, it's uh, a subject that uh, um, takes C++ to the next level, uh, takes C language to the next level. You have already been in IPC144, uh, and uh, you kind of know the syntax of C language. Uh, now what we need to do is uh, to apply a methodology, a way of thinking to it that we'll understand and, and hopefully we can kind of relate to it. It's called uh, an object-oriented language, ob object orientation, and we're going to go through it and we'll see exactly what it is. But before doing all that, I'm going to start with a few uh, uh, rules and regulations that we're going to go through this semester and we're going to see what's going to be, what, how we're going to manage this subject. Um, uh, mm, yeah, let's, uh, let's uh, start with uh, the most important thing. So you're going to be here a lot. So uh, the, you know that uh, organization that you have your workshops on? It was 100, uh, 144, 100, right? Remember that? Now it's 244, 200, okay? <clears throat> and uh, one of the things that I do, I'm not aware of anyone else doing it or not, is that I have... Uh, my notes and anything that I do in class immediately going on GitHub. So uh, OP244, NA, your NAA, correct? <clears throat> NAA and NBB notes, everything's going to be up here. Anything I do in class, any code that is written in class immediately goes over here. And if you look at it, we already have NBB section over there, and they had this amazing thing that printed hello. We're going to come to it soon, too. <laughs> All right? <clears throat> um, um, the very first thing you're going to do over here is what I call workshop zero. So you have till the end of the week to do this. Uh, workshop zero is uh, uh, bringing you into uh, the real world of programming. Okay? So you, um, what I'm actually doing is I'm exposing you and I'm making you visible online by doing this. It's making my life much easier. What you're going to see is going to make your life much easier too, um, apart from uh, making you visible online. When I say it makes you visible online is that when you apply for your co-op, when you apply for your uh, dream job that you have, the very first thing that they do, they don't look at your resume. First, they Google your name. Okay, And they Google your name. The very first thing that's going to come up by doing this is GitHub. Okay, and if they see your name under GitHub and somebody who's been in GitHub for two years, that means green light, 20% more chance that you're going to get hired because there is no legit and proper application in the world that is not developed on Git. Zero. Okay, anything anyone does goes on Git. Okay. Which brings us to the thing. What is Git? <clears throat> um, before actually doing that, let me just tell you, and this, this place is really quiet. Just seriously, I can hear myself think. <laughs> Other places, it's like mayhem, but this is nice. I like this class, all right? Kind of like teaching online. <laughs> but I see your faces. That's a good thing. Because usually, you don't uh, turn on your uh, videos. Over here, you cannot do that. Of course, some of them, some of the people actually turn off their videos for security, <laughs> the mask, which is very good. Uh, but yeah, so I had my four doses of vaccine, so uh, I'm hoping that I'm not going to be that bad if I get something. Anyways, uh, so I was talking about Git uh, to see what Git is. Um, uh, uh, and before doing that, I'm going to tell you how I teach. Um, if you have ever seen any of my videos on OOP244, if you have ever watched any of those, what I do when I actually teach people, I keep polling. So every two minutes, I issue a poll, and I ask people to answer questions, and if they don't answer, I'll pick on them. Over here, it happens like this. I ask question. The gentleman either wants to answer the question, 
or he's not in a mood or doesn't know the answer. He's, he can just tell me pass. And then this gentleman becomes my victim. And I keep going like that, okay? So um, there is something in networking called half duplex and full duplex communication. A half duplex communication is you listening to radio. So somebody's playing the music or giving the news, hoping that at home you're listening to it. There's no way for them to know you're, that you're actually doing it, okay? That's half duplex. A full duplex communication is like watching a video on a website. When you're watching a video on a website, you're sending your IP to them. They know exactly what you are watching, how long you, are wa you have watched it, what you have done, so they know everything. So essentially, you send them an acknowledgement. Or walking, talking on a two-way radio. When you're walking on a two-way two radio, you talk, the person says, got it, or Roger, whatever you say, right? So you get acknowledgement. And if, if they don't give you the acknowledgement that I got it, you're going to repeat it, okay? That's full duplex communication. That's what I want to do in class, which means I want to get feedback from you. I don't want you to just sit over there and looking at me. That's not going to work. So I want you to answer me and get involved in the teaching that I'm doing. So therefore, I'll go like this and I can ask. Like that. Okay, so uh, any who has heard of Git? Just heard, not know what Git is. Who know? Who have heard Git? Okay. All right. Who have heard GitHub? Okay, GitHub. If you if you don't do like this, it means you haven't been an IPC one four first even because GitHub is there, right? Okay. So uh, uh, anybody knows what? Like, can you give me a, 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 a like brief thing of what Git is? Anybody knows what Git is? You can, you can commit your code. That's what you can do with Git. What, what is Git? Version control. And version control means? One more time, sorry. Different people collaborate together. So how, it, so how does it work? So can you do that on Dropbox or? OneDrive and stuff like that, you can't do that because it really gets messed up. How does Git, as, wh where did Git come from? Anybody knows? Oh, yeah. That's my hero. Yeah, Linus. Uh, anybody knows who's Linus? Linus Torvald? Linux. He's the person who created Linux. Okay? He created Linux. And Linux is the largest open source project in the world. It has hundreds of thousands of committers, people who commit code, uh, collaborate, fix issues, and stuff like that. So Linus first created this Linux thingy, and it boomed. And people started helping, and he, and he could not manage so many contributions to, the, to this operating system. It became disorganized, and thing would have been overwritten by mistake. So he wrote Git. What is Git? What is the difference between Git and regular application? We have an application called client server application. Client server application is what you do with your websites. You have a web server, you have a browser. Browser is your client, you put an address, you go to a web server, you see a web page. That's a client server, which means one is a server, serves you something, one is a client, gets something. FTP, come in, come in. You never need to knock, just come in, okay. All right. So. And um, um, yeah, so that's a client server thing, uh, like FTP. Like, like you, do, you do FTP, you have FTP client, you connect, or, or Telnet, or SSH. All these things, SSH client. These things are client servers. So you have a server that serves something, you have a client that uses its features, and so on and so forth. Git doesn't work that way. Git is developed, what we call it, uh, in, a, in a distributed way. It's a distributed application. What does it mean? It means there is no client, there is no server. Every instance of Git is a fully functional, fully functional Git server and client and everything. So the Git on GitHub and the Git on your computer are, ident are identical with exact same capabilities. None of them supersedes the other one. Anything you do on your machine, you can do on GitHub. Anything you do on GitHub, you can do on your machine. They wonder me, why do we need GitHub? To make it? <laughs> to make it profile. Profit. That's a profile. profile? 
Uh, I, profit I like better. <laughs> Yeah, to, to share, like what happens is that like when Gitcock created, it's an open source thing, right? The comp that some smart people came together and said, okay, for this gentleman to be able to actually share its application with someone else, he has to create a repository. Somebody else creates a repository. He needs to have a, a, a static IP address so they can connect to their computer and, and do all the things that they do. So they said, instead of doing that, we're going to create this humongous cluster of servers. We're going to install Git and let everybody use our servers. So Git becomes a place that is safe. You have your, uh, the GitHub becomes a safe place where you can have your repositories. And how Git works, it works like this. You create a repository. A repository essentially is a directory that is supervised by Git. Git's like a big brother is watching to see what you do and remembers everything that you have done. It listens to actions that are called commit. Every single time you commit something to it, it tracks what changes were made, how it was made, and what was, what did you do, and keeps track of it. So every single commit that you do, you can come back to later on if you want. Okay? That's what Git does. The second thing that is amazing about it is that you can clone that repository, which means the repository that you created on GitHub, you clone it on your computer. Because Git is a distributed thing, GitHub, your computer, potatoes, potatoes, same thing. Instead of being online, keep putting it to OneDrive over and over and over, all you need to do is to work on your computer and keep committing to your own computer. It keeps track of it, of it and over and over and over and over and over. And now you have a problem. You want to ask Pardot for help. You push these to Git. So all the history and action, everything that you have done, will be pushed to upstream, they call it, which is the original repository to Git. And you added me, hopefully, in Workshop Zero as a collaborator to that repository. And you tell me, far that I need help. I simply go on my computer. I pull your repository because I already cloned it. I pull your repository. I take a look at you. I share my screen with you. I'm not going to ask you to give me your screen. I'm going to share my screen with you so you see my screen. Then I open your work. You explain to me what is wrong. You explain to me, what did you do that not be able to fix it? I go through your mistake, walk through it, fix your code, make your thing work, whatever you're supposed to do, and I push my changes back to GitHub. Now, what you do is a pull. You get all the changes, and it applies it to your code. You tell to Git, show me the differences. Git brings up two things side by side. Your original code, the one that is pulled, highlights all the differences. And then you simply do a reflection, far that, do you did this and that, and put it in a workshop, and I'm good. So like this, we can collaborate on the code. We don't have to, and we don't have to go through hassle of sending, zip the code and send it to me. Let me connect to your thing, remote desktop thingy. The mouse doesn't move. The internet is slow. These things are all gone. And you cre you cre you clone the same thing on Matrix, and bye bye FTP. You simply push your code to GitHub. You go on Matrix. You pull it. Done and submit it. You don't need to worry about, like, did I set it on ASCII when I was uploading, or it was binary? Should I? You don't need to think about these things anymore. You just push and pull, and everything's done automatically. And everyone in the world is doing that, ladies and gentlemen. If we are not doing it, we are dinosaurs. OK? So that's why Workshop Zero, it's not in a, in a workshop that, we, that they have. I don't know what other props do. This is what I do. And if you don't do that, I'm not going to help you. You need Workshop Zero done. You need to do this. It's a series of stuff. If you have a problem, I'll troubleshoot it for you. I'll try to fix it for you. If you have Mac, <coughs> um, if you have any Apple computer, you need to install uh, that. You have an extra st uh, step. You need to install a virtual machine, and you need to install uh, Look for Fusion. You can download it for free because you're a student. You can actually use it. Uh, download Fusion. Install Windows. 
a virtual machine on your computer, uh, give it some, uh, assign to it some memory and some CPU. The good thing about virtual machines is that when you shut it down, it's as if you have done nothing on your computer. The difference between a virtual machine and a boot camp, boot camp they call it, right, on, on, on Apple, is that when you do boot camp thingy, it separates the hard drive in two pieces, and half of the resources of your computer is gone, so your hard drive shrinks. With virtual machines, you assign it 60 gigs, it uses, if it's 30, it uses the 30, and it just keeps it as a file in there. And when you bring it up, you can give it the power that you need if you want 8 gigs of RAM, you give it 8 gigs of RAM. If you want 2 gigs of RAM, so if you have nothing in there, and you don't need to have your email in there, you, you just put a Windows uh, Visual Studio and get stuff that is nothing. Okay, they're nothing. You just put those things, you can do your schoolwork, push it to the Git, and just collapse it. You don't even have it, have it on your Mac. Okay? It's not that I don't like Mac. Okay? It's the fact that you need to learn how to work with this tool. There's no way around it. If you want to be someone in this world, you need to know to work with a capable IDE, and one of the best ones in the world is Visual Studio. Okay, I'm not a Microsoft fan or a Linux fan. My computers at home are Linux because I, I love Linux. It's a beautiful app, it's actually minus Fedora, but whatever, it's a Linux, it doesn't make any difference. But what I'm saying is that it doesn't make any difference what you like when you are learning, you need to learn properly. You, don't, you shouldn't take sides. If you are uh, going through a Linux administration course and you have a, a, a Windows, that's stupid. <laughs> you need to work on a Linux machine, right? And that's when virtual machine comes handy. You simply create another one that is Linux. Now you have a Linux computer. So regardless of what you're liking it with your computer, you can have any virtual machine that you want on your computer and you run it. And they are all perfect computers. Don't think that they are limited in any way. Okay? Every single demo that you see on my YouTube videos, they are done on virtual machines. Everything. And they work amazingly with no problem. Okay, so do that. If you don't want to do it, then you have to, instead of using easy ways with, because right now I don't want you to get involved with the nerdy command line Git thingy. I want you to do something visual with mouse and the explorer and file system, that, uh, the, the GUI file system that you have. I want you to learn how Git works. When you're comfortable with it, then you're going to go look at the engine and see how you can do nerdish stuff with it. Okay, it's like you first you learn how to drive, and five years after you drive, you open the hole. Oh, let me see the, the, the engine, how it works. Okay, you don't have to learn it at the beginning. You just go step by step. So that's what I do. Uh, Git is, uh, has a book called Git Book. So if you Google it, it's an open source book. It's uh, done by O'Reilly. You can actually go. It's online. You read chapter one and two. Each one is like 40 pages, and you know Git more than me. Okay? It's easy as that. Like 40 pages is, by the way, when I say each one is 40 pages, don't go, <gasps> when you get a job, they put a manual, instruction manual of a language you've never heard of it that is 900 pages, and you have three days to start programming with it. Okay, so we are in college. Don't go, <gasps> 40 pages? 40 pages is nothing, okay? And you'll see it's nothing. It's not that difficult, okay? So yes, so after installing all the Git stuff, you can go read the Git book. Uh, and by the way, your Mac comes with Git. So if you type Git in your terminal, you'll see it actually uh, responds to you. So if you know the command lines, you don't need to install anything. You can just do everything via command line. That's fine too. All right? So workshop zero. What is it? It's in this uh, uh, YouTube series of YouTube uh, things that I put over here. Um, and it tells you how to install Visual Studio 2020. Uh, 2022, Git installation, pod installation, GitHub account, setting up your GitHub profile. Darth Vader is not a good name. Okay? Prince of Persia, not a good one. Cat killer, definitely not good. Okay? <laughs> Remember, internet never forgets. Create a proper user ID on GitHub, becoming of an executive officer of a big company because you're going to be with it for the rest of your life. Okay? It's like naming your child. Okay? So think about it. Just don't go with this. Yeah, I've got to put this, 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 this. Hate this 
shit, and call it that. Oops, it's recorded, sorry. <laughs> so I'm going to beep it later. Beep. Anyway, so yeah, so, so don't call this. I hate this thing. That's not a good user ID, OK? And later on, when you're working for IBM, what is your GitHub ID? I hate this thing. <laughs> you know? so, so don't do that. Put proper names. Think about it. It's going to be with you. When they Google, it's going to come up, and it's going to show who you are, OK? Put your email, Seneca email ID as primary email for now. You can always change it to whatever you want after you graduate. The good thing is that when you go on any Git repository, when you actually log into the website on GitHub, there is an up, a button at the top that you can click called watch. If you click on watch, any change to the repository happens, Git sends you an email. So you want to know exactly when the workshop's going to be posted? Git's going to tell you. If something is wrong with a workshop and we are issuing an ops, uh, update, you get an update for it. It's because that's what's going to happen. We are designing stuff and things are going to go wrong. So that's that. The funny thing is that I put this thing on do not disturb, but still it's disturbing me. Let's quit the audio and hopefully it's going to be good. So that's that. So you go through these steps, and by the end of these steps that you get over here, Workshop zero is done. You don't need to submit anything. If I get a message from you that uh, you added me as a collaborator, we are done. So let me see if I actually have one such thing in here. Oh, I have to connect to global protect, protect thingy. Give me a second. See, that, that's exactly what I was talking about. So, so now half of the thing is gone. You can actually listen to the other one, doesn't matter. So for all those who are listening to this, we forgot to record. So you just uh, heard 25 seconds of the beginning, and now we are starting halfway through the, yeah. There's never guarantee. That's, what, that's, that's a perfect example for it. Don't rely on recordings. It's not like we are doing it at home. And big blue button is recording it automatically. I have to do something, and a click on something, and a push on some, of something will uh, by mistakes, pause the recording, and we don't want to do that. So, so yeah. Um, uh, what else I wanted to talk about? And I saw the recording thingy, and I forgot everything. Uh, so yeah. So these are uh, the these are on the server, and then the downloadable material over here. You can clone and use it, um, and. Uh, Quickly, we talked about uh, uh, borrowing code. If you borrow code, cite it, and you'll be OK. It is written over there. So you can, if you read the instructions and stuff in every single workshop, all the things that I told you, they are in the workshop. So you, uh, if you just read it, you, you didn't miss much. <coughs> so um, that's that. What else we have in here? Announcements, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, labs are not uh, fully labbed. Usually we have, uh, um, usually we have uh, 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 l uh, half of the lab or more used for lectures. Uh, all the lectures and materials are on GitHub, and, and everything gets posted immediately on GitHub after we're done. The path is here, and this is the, well, no, that's not, that's uh, somebody's uh, workshop zero. So um, this is the uh, repository for it. Um, uh, yes, as I mentioned, the office hours are the times that it's guaranteed that I'm, and I'm there, and the rest of it, um, you can call me anytime I'm not busy. Uh, let me see what else we have. Quizzes every week, 70% on previous, 30% on future material. Workshops. We have two types of workshops, pre-study break, post-study break. Pre-study break, each workshop has two parts. Part number one, heavily guided, which means essentially you go through the instructions and you can do the workshop, OK? Part number two is a simple application, simpler application that, that, than part one, but no instructions. We just tell you what you want, and you do it. We call it DIY. OK? So the first one is the one that you follow instructions. The second one, you use the same concepts, but you do it yourself. 
Okay, that's part one and two. Each one has its has a percentage. Uh, uh, 30% this, 30% that. Uh, you'll see exactly what is the percentage of his, each workshop for the weight of the workshop. And uh, sorry, 50% uh, each. Uh, and then you have a reflection. Reflection <coughs> is not worth anything. But if you don't do it, you lose 40%. So it only has a negative effect. Reflection must be there. But if you don't do it, you get 40% penalty. OK? It's very important to do the reflection. A reflection comes with part two, not part one, okay? And that's for the six first six workshops before the study break. After the study break, we have only part one. Why? Because the project kicks in. Uh, the project is one big application that actually does something, okay? It's not like a workshop that you do little thing to learn concepts. I'm, I'm, and every single time I'm trying to come up with some kind of scenario that uh, makes sense with in today's situation. Like when COVID hit, it was vaccination tracking and uh, uh, hospital triage. And uh, when uh, Ukraine disaster happened, it became uh, aid uh, disaster recovery, uh, aid aid uh, provi pro uh, providing aid for disasters uh, uh, situations, so you can keep track of uh, what you're sending on what you're shipping to the places that they need help. So things like that. Every time I'll try to come up with some kind of a application. Uh, <clears throat> so these kind of application, these ap this application is done in five milestones. Okay? Milestone one, two, three, and four are the engine of the application. So you are writing pieces and parts, and each milestone has a due date that is not firm, which means you can be even one week late and you get full mark for it. So milestone one, two, three, four, each one has 10% of the mark for the, for the project. Milestone five is the main application using all these things to do what the application is supposed to do. And that is 60% of the mark. Milestone five is submitted in six different pieces because I don't want you to go crazy because you didn't do one part, you lose 60%. So each feature of the application, for example, if it's a point of sale system, uh, Selling the product is one test. Restocking the inventory is another one. Uh, changing the, uh, setting the expiry date of uh, uh, perishable food, this one. So each, each, uh, I check like uh, the point that uh, the cashier system, another one. So each one is going to be one test. So if you miss parts of the thing, you, you can still get lots of marks. So that six stages, each one is 10%, it's total of 100%, okay? And that's how the project is done. Um, try to be on time on the due dates on, of the milestones. That keeps you on track. I know as soon as you put uh, your uh, back on the chair as a student, you procrastinate. That's in students blood okay like I'm gonna do it tomorrow today if let's go beer drinking I know that okay we all do that I do that okay but but please don't be late on your milestones because it it uh, adds up very quickly okay and because it's a full project you are creating if you don't do the first one it's not like a workshop I don't do part but I'll do part two that's not the case if you don't do the first milestone you can't do the second one okay and the submission of all four milestones are mandatory. So even if you are three weeks late and you get zero for it, you have to submit it because each test for the milestone proves that the application works properly. Okay? So that's the final project and the workshops. <clears throat> Please don't come to me and ask me what is the due date for such and such because each class has its own lab time and due dates and stuff like that. The due dates are different. Okay? May be different. If that's the case, then don't ask me because I give you something wrong, information wrong, that, and it causes trouble. Just type the submit command that you have and the path for your uh, deliverable, whatever it is, and type dash do. It tells you exactly what the due dates were. So essentially, your submit a program does a few things that you need to know. Let me log into it to Matrix as a student. Uh, so,
So if I say over here tilde farda menlu slash submit, let's say 244, 244 workshop, I don't know, workshop five, part one. If I go dash do, it actually gives me what is the due date, okay? What was the due date? Of course, if I want to submit, it's going to tell me it's rejected because it's too late. You know that. But what is important is not to put anything in here and hit enter and see what happens, okay? So dash do tells you what the due date is. Skip spaces. So if you cannot match the output with spaces, like the spaces are not formatted properly, and you still want to submit it, you do dash skip spaces. And it's going to skip the spaces. It doesn't care if you have proper alignment. It still submits it. Of course, you're going to lose a few marks, but you can submit it. If you have some extra blank lines that you cannot get rid of for some reason, and you want to submit still your code, you put dash skip blank lines. Or you can combine them both, this one and that one. Okay, and, and you can still submit it, okay? So these are the features of submitter. Why are you doing that? You didn't know that? You never submit, you clicked on a thing to see what help it provides you. It tells you right over there. It's the message of submitter. Feedback, what is feedback? Feedback is when something goes out of date and you cannot submit it anymore, but you want to make sure it works properly, that's feedback. So it's a dry run. It runs the test. All it doesn't, it only does one, it doesn't do one thing and that's submission. So if the workshop is out and it's not open yet and you have done it, you want to test it, dash feedback is your friend, okay? It just runs it. And these are the things. So I'll, if you think there is a feature needed to this thing that uh, tell me maybe I'm gonna develop it. The last time I did it was a long time ago. So. And uh, uh, my colleagues always make fun of the version of it because it never gets one. <laughs> 0 0.99.8.2. Point and uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so that's that. Uh, <clears throat> Midterm test is going to be on, on the 7th. What the format test, every, anything, uh, probably I'll tell you a day before the test because I'm very weak. When, if I design the test a week before, I'll give up the, I'll tell the questions. <laughs> I, cannot keep my, I cannot keep a secret. Let's put it that way. So usually I design everything the night before or two days before, something like that, okay? Uh, but so the format's gonna be like that. And uh, I'll tell you what the format's gonna be uh, a couple of days before that, how it's gonna be done. But uh, we are doing it at school in your lab. So your lab is the time you're doing your tests your, uh, <coughs> no, 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 I'm not going to give you two days to say, oh, I didn't do it, when it even when, it, when we were online, okay? So you, you start at a certain time, you have two hours to do it, and that's it, okay? We all start and we end. It's going to be on Blackboard, but you have only s the hours that you are in the lab, that's the time that you have. If you're comfortable with your own computer, please bring it to the lab, okay? If you don't want to use Seneca computers, make sure you have your own computers. You have the internet. Oh, you have the internet. Oh, you want cheat sheet? We just Google it? Yeah, Google it, sure. No, 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 no. No, sure. I, the, the tests are like that. I don't mind you Google to see how something works. As long as you don't copy it. Oh, okay. If you just see how it's done and you do it, mission accomplished. Like anybody have ever done anything in a company saying like you have to do this, not do Googling? Is it possible? <laughs> Yeah, you can actually have a cheat sheet for yourself pre prepared on a USB thingy to bring it. It doesn't matter. We call it reference sheet, not cheat sheet, but hey. Okay. Same thing with final assessment. I keep everything open with cheating and stuff. You know that. Like I give every uh, students a chance to do the best they can. That's why I really get pissed off when somebody cheats. Okay? And sadly... I could say almost for the first time in 25 plus years that I'm teaching, I had to actually report people for cheating in past two and a half years during COVID. Uh, like the cheating went, okay? And it is impossible not to get caught. Like it is impossible. Imagine, 
all we need to do, I have to write a program that removes all the variable names. And just, it's like a DNA search. I just go for the keyword statements of the, of the language, fast, for, if, while, all those things. I make it an array. Then I compare the two programs. And I'll simply make a small section and I search over it. If it's a match, I widen the search. If the pattern is the same, done. So change it as much as you want. Make the function up and down. You're going to get caught. OK? It's, it's programming is like a fingerprint. Impossible for two people to do the same. Absolutely impossible. Try it. <laughs> Try it. I don't even need to write a program for that. Like when I'm actually looking at the person, wait a minute, this looks familiar. And you know what the funny part is? The people that cheat and I get them, you know what mostly the problem is? They both make the same mistake. You are doing something, you write the code, and it's like, what is this? Oh, I cannot believe it did that. Then, wait a minute, it's exactly the same thing. And those people who cheat are not the brightest ones. Sometimes they forget to remove the name of the other person. <laughs> and that happens, that happens for me three times. So I'm telling you, like the comments, like you see, they have the exact same comments for the code that is different. So again, it's not difficult to get. So those who cheat, and, and, I do, and I don't really like it. I give you all the opportunity to submit your code and get the mark you deserve. Um, yes, again. And um, uh, I believe in, uh, in improvement. And if you have, so, so we have all these things that we say midterm has this much mark, that one has that much mark. That's perfectly good. I understand that. But if I see, it's, it's, as a professor, it's my discretion. If I see, I cannot do it to the final test, but for the rest of the stuff, when I see, okay, the, the first quiz you, it was bad, the second is better, the third is getting better, the fourth one you're getting a better mark. Your midterm is not very good, but your project is getting better, and your final test is about, when I see something like that, I'm not gonna make you suffer because of the midterm that you did bad. I'm, I'm not gonna average it. Okay, no, no, none of the profs do that. Okay, when you look at the, when I see somebody improved, okay, but if I see 100, 0, 100, 0, 100, that means you're cheating. Okay, but if I see improvement, then I'll help you. Okay, so don't worry. So um, it, it happens all the time. Uh, that's that. Um, the addendum is over here with all the things that I talked about. So everything is is in here explaining exactly what uh, needs to do, what you need to do, what you cover, and everything. I think, um, uh, did we do the site? No, citation and everything's gotta be in the project. So when you see the project at the beginning of the project, it tells you exactly uh, what you need to do uh, if, you if you wanna get help from someone else. So that's that one. Can I go back, can I go back? Yeah, that's that one. The, the, the oh, uh, and I'm gonna actually, uh, it's possible, that we are all getting together again, it means we are all gonna get sick, okay? It happens all the time, okay? So um, not necessarily COVID, but we get sick, we get flu and stuff like that, it's gonna happen. Um, I suggest if I get sick, we don't cancel the class, we just switch to online. We can do that, right? So if, so we switch for that thing to online, so if I can, if I, if I can teach, if I'm well enough to teach, Let's do that. So if that's the case, I'm going to add something over here for online lecture, add something, but it doesn't mean that we are online. It means if something happens, you're going to have something in here to get to big blue button, and so we can actually go through that. So let's have that one. Any questions? Suggestions? Objections? All right, let's go for like five, 10 minutes break. We are in lack of oxygen in here. Uh, and then we'll come back and continue. Oh, does it leave? Le can you? No. Oh, that, those have wheels under.
Let's get five minutes break and then. Any questions, anything, seriously? No questions about anything? Oh, oh, you have questions? So, okay, that's after the break. Because, yeah, let, let's do the break in there. Please remind me to continue recording. I'm pausing. <laughs> All right, so uh, you have a question. Okay, uh, so Git is an application, a distributed application that we install on our computer. And it has some command line commands that you issue, like push and pull and clone and all the stuff. Tortoise Git is a GUI shell that runs those commands behind it. So instead of typing command clone from this thing, you simply right click on a on a thing and you. So, so if you are at AL online, you don't need to have Tortoise Git what at all. Tortoise Git is for us rookies. If you if you are already a seasoned Git user, come teach me, please. Okay. Other than that, it's just it's just help. It's just help. It just helps with that. So what I what I like you to do to get familiar with the action, and later on learn how to use command line to do that action. Okay, I don't want you to get distracted by syntax. I rather you first learn what Git does, and then learn how to do it using command. And you're gonna learn it in many different ways. And Git is everywhere. Like you. Um, uh, you will find out that you you even uh, um, um, submit you set up machines small machines called containers and you push those containers into a repository and later on if you want that machine five of those machine you push it and you clone it in different places <laughs> so you have five so. And this is something called Kubernetes. So you're going to see that all these things, that everything works with Git, OK? Something's working behind the scene. So <clears throat> just be aware of that. So uh, other questions? Other people have questions? I say, anybody have question? No, nobody have question? Three people said we have question. I said, I'm going to do it after the break. <laughs> One person I asked, the other two? Oh. Oh. Oh, okay, okay. All right. Anyone else? No. Go ahead. I don't know. Go try it. <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> Put it in MS Teams so we know. Is it cat killer? You're ready. <laughs> You're the one. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so uh, how I teach. This is how I teach. I open a Visual Studio, and this is 2019. I'm going to update it to 2020 later on, or uh, hopefully if my Seneca machine works, then I'm going to use a Seneca machine instead of my own computer. But uh, I create a new project, and I create that new project inside the repository I cloned from GitHub. So I'm going to click on Next. So this one is for 345. We're not going to do that. We're going to go to Seneca 244, uh, 2227. And this is the repository that you have up there. I just I cloned it before. So I'm just going to open that. And I'm going to create over here a new directory. I'm going to call it NAA. And in that NAA, I'm going to uh, create the project. So the project is going to be 01, because this is the first session that we have. And it's going to be September uh, 7th. OK? I'm going to click on create, and I create the session, and I start coding. And I teach while I'm coding. So every single thing that I teach, I do. So you see how it's done, and then you. So any code that I write, you're free to use anywhere in your project, in your workshop, without citation. OK? If you cite it, thank you. But if you don't, it's your prop's code. You're supposed to use it, right? So it doesn't matter, all right? So um, I right click over here. I'm going to say add new item. I usually call it prg.cpp and I rename it as it progresses. So I keep 
uh, adding different versions. So you're going to see one, two, three, and each one, each name of the file relates to the topic that we are talking about. So you'll see how things are happening. So in here, this one, I'm going to call it prg.cpp. And if, if it's only prg.cpp, it means that was the only thing we talked about. There are no different topics, so you can see what's going on. So uh, it's like C language. First, we start with an include, and I'm going to say IO stream. Unlike C, C language, you don't have .h for your header files. Um, um, all header files of C++, they don't carry the dot. They are implemented in .h, but they don't put the .h for the system header files. The system header files reside in, a, in what we call a namespace. You'll find out what a namespace is. All the standard things of C++, all the aspects of the language in C++ that comes with the language are inside a namespace called STD. So we're going to call using namespace STD, which means I'm using it. If I don't do that, for every single command that I use from C++ standard library, I have to say STD column column. Those two columns are called scope resolution. So I have to say STD scope resolution this. STD scope. By saying using, it means, hey, I'm using this. Don't worry. Everything that you see, if you can't find it, look in STD, you're going to find it. <clears throat> and now in here, I'm going to say int main return zero. And in here, I'm going to say, I'm going to insert into the console output object. I'm going to insert hello op 244 NAA, and I'm going to insert an end line to the console output. And I'm going to run the program, and result of that insertion will be printing it. Okay? So that's how C works. It works with objects. We don't have uh, a function based thing. Why is that good and how it helps us? Uh, the explanation is very simple. <clears throat> yeah. And I give this example to all my classes, every single class. If you listen to the other recording, you're going to see that I mentioned this example right at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> imagine that it's uh, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, and you're sleeping, and you're dreaming about the best things that you dream at night. Okay, and Suddenly, you hear somebody beside your head, ear says, wake up. <laughs> okay? You wake up. No one's there. You thought you were dreaming. And as you think of that I was dreaming, you hear again, wake up. <laughs> What's going to be your reaction? I will die. Well, yeah, I'm going to probably pee in your pants. Eh? You'll run to the door. Ah! Okay? Why? Why? Why you get scared? Why something is wrong? What went wrong? So, encounter something unknown? Why? What caused you to think there is something unknown? I want you to think like a programmer. Analyze it. Talk about all the details. What is scary when you hear at 3 o'clock in the morning, wake up, and you wake up, and you hear it again, and no one is there to say it? What is wrong with this picture? Nobody can say it? It's perfectly OK? No, there is no one in the house. And you are not crazy. You are not crazy. There is no one in the house, and you're hearing, wake up. What's wrong? What is missing here? A person who says, wake up, correct? Let's change this scenario. You wake up at a three o'clock, you're sleeping at three o'clock in the morning, and you hear, wake up. You wake up, you see your little sister behind, beside you. She just woke up, she's scared, she had a nightmare. She wants to come and sleep in your bed. Anything wrong with that? It's actually the sweetest thing, right? Come here, little boo. All right? So. The first one was C language. You have printf. It prints. Who is printing it? You have scanf. Who is reading it? No one owns anything. There is no 
all the actions that are happening, they have no owner. Who is, ru who is running what? That's not the case. Our mission is to understand that why, why this is not, why this, why, why even we switch to object orientation? Our brains cannot handle it. No matter how good of a programmer you are, your brain cannot understand things happening without anybody doing it. That's why the programs you're writing can never get complicated, because your brain cannot handle the complication. Our brains are amazing computers with horrible interfaces. You put your key somewhere, you forget where it was. You think you don't know where your keys are? You know, it's somewhere in your memory. You can't just get to it. You sleep and suddenly you dream about it and you remember. So the user interface, the access to your brains, they suck. Because of that, we have to make our work so organized, so lifelike, so similar to what we have in real world, so our brain use the patterns to understand how things are supposed to happen. That's called object orientation. So instead of printing something with a printf, I'm going to say I have an object called console. I insert something into it. Object, that's not a command. Cout is not a command. Cout is a thing. Is an object, you're doing something in. In an object-oriented world, you learn instead of <clears throat> creating an application for a bank, what do you do? If I say I, I want to have a bank with a checking and a saving account and stuff like that, what do you do? If you are doing with C language, how you program that? You have to say, I'm going to create a variable, call it checking account, and I'm going to create a function, pass the address of that variable to the function. When deposit happens, it adds something. You have to do something like that. In C++, I'm going to say, I'm going to create an object called account. That account knows how to deposit money into itself. That account knows how to withdraw money from itself. Now I'm going to say, I have an account. I create an object called checking out of the account. Now I'm going to say checking, withdraw, checking, deposit. I'm going to create another account called saving. I'm going to say saving dot deposit because they are both of type account. Checking and saving, they both know how to withdraw and deposit. That's an object-oriented thing. We create objects. We hire employees, professional, the employees know how to do their job so we can manage them and have SpaceX. You think Elon Musk is just building a rocket? No. He knows how to hire the best to do stuff like that. That's what an object-oriented world is. You hire the best, or if you don't hire the best, you train the best, which means if you are creating an accounting program and you are creating an account, you Put all your focus on the action of depositing something into an account. And you ignore everything else. You only think of that account. And then you finish it, you set it aside, you forget about it. Then you create a customer account, a customer class, a customer object. That customer <clears throat> knows how to uh, get money and deposit it into an account and you forget about it. And then you create all the things that a bank needs to do. And after you created all those things together, you put them aside and say, shoo! Everything starts working perfectly because each entity in the bank knows how everything's going to work. That's an object-oriented world. And that's our journey this semester. We're going to learn how to set aside the structure brain of our hours and convert it to an object-oriented brain. It's a methodology that we are going to learn, the way of thinking. We'll no longer are going to think how things happen. We are going to learn how things are. And therefore, they will work properly. OK? That's the only way complicated applications can be written. Other than that, we're just going to get lost in our own code. 
and we cannot manage anything. Okay? That was, in a nutshell, object orientation. Of course, we're going to have lots of different things that we're going to talk about. Like, there are certain rules and regulations we have to follow so we can actually create an object-oriented program. What is really needed for me to have an object? What is really needed for me to have an object? When you think about it, look, about, look around you right now. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. You have 20 students in this class, OK? Look around you. You are all of the time of same objects. You're, you are all the same object. You are all human beings, right? When I say a human being, you close your eyes and you can picture something. Okay? Of course, we cannot decide if it's a lady or a gentleman. But it's still a human being. We still have ears, eyes, nose. We walk. We reproduce. So everything is, all the co common things are there. Of course, later on, I can say, okay, I, <clears throat> I, I have all the descriptions of a human being, which means all the specifications of a thing called human and all the things a human can do together. This action, putting these two things together, we call it encapsulation. We put the data and the behavior for data all in one capsule. Okay? That's the first thing. Then I need to be able to have this capsule and create similar capsule, but with little differences. I have a human. Now I have a male human. I have a female human. They are both humans, but they have minor differences. Needs of my application. That's called inheritance. We have... <clears throat> Pigeons, they are flying creatures, correct? We have airplanes, they are flying creatures. We have helicopters, they are flying cre cre creatures. These flying objects, they all fly. Do we agree with that? A pigeon flies, airplane flies, helicopter flies. Do they use the same method of flying? No, they all accomplish the same thing in a different way, correct? This is called polymorphism. Doing the same thing in a different way. The gentleman talks, the lady talks. Or, forget about that. <clears throat> I speak. If you don't mention to me how I speak, I'm going to speak Farsi. And what is your native language? No, no, I don't know. You have. Ancestry language, what, what is your native, so it's English, what, what is yours? Hindi, there you go. So if I talk to him and tell him to speak, and I don't mention what is going to speak in his native language that is Hindi, okay? If I ask you, what is it? English? Is there somebody over here other than English, whatever say, what is you? Hindi. Oh, Farsi, Hindi, and English, what is yours? Mandarin, there you go. So if I don't mention, Mandarin is going to come up. We all speak. We all communicate, but in different ways. So the action of communication, talking, is a polymorphic function. This is called polymorphism. Simple as that. Okay? So that's the second. That, actually, I told you all the three things that you have to follow to have an object-oriented language. Uh, object-oriented program. First, you have to put the data and behavior together so you have a class. So as soon as I say human, two ears and nose and two eyes comes with it. You don't need to mention. When I say car, wheels, steering wheel, movement comes. I don't need to mention. When I say bicycle, uh, something with two wheels is going to come. Everybody knows what a bicycle is. And <clears throat> if I want to make a motorcycle out of that, what do I do? I'm going to say I have a bicycle, stick an engine to it, that's a motorcycle. So a motorcycle is a bicycle with engine. That's inheritance. I have a design. I reuse my design. I create something new. Of course, bicycle moves. Motorcycle moves. One you have to pedal. The other one you increase the throttle. Movement is polymorphic. Two different things. Doing the same thing in a different way. Hence, object-oriented. 
So these three things you put together, you have an object-oriented program. And we're going to learn the syntax to do so in C++. C, you couldn't do that. In C, you created a structure. You put variables in a structure. Can you put a function in a structure? No. In C++, you can. Hence, they are in behavior together. Right? And many more things that you've got to see. That's the easiest example for it. So we're going to go through that. We're going to learn it. It's an easy concept. Uh, please go through that IPC 144 review. I don't want to teach you polymorphism and you think how the hat tail, that for loop worked. OK? Please do that. OK? Um, Please go through that IPC thingy. If, if, you, if you are OK with it, you're fine. But if you feel there are parts like pointers, you're confused about it, you don't know how it works, go look at that thing and see what it is. So when we are talking about these things, you don't get lost in syntax when I talk about concept. OK? Are we good? Any question one? Any question two? Yes. Oh, I'm going to lecture. Oh, yeah. Every Monday that you're coming here, I'm not going to have enough time. Right now, we are one week behind. Right now, we are one week behind. There goes half of the labs of the semester. Right? So, so keep that in mind. And we're going to have lots of Mondays that are holidays, I think. So there you go. So, huh? Yeah, of course. That's what I was saying. Like, if it's a ho holiday, my wife's going to. It's being recorded. <laughs> but what happens is that, and I know I'm going to say it online, it doesn't matter, but uh, um, my wife, one day my wife went on this uh, ratemyprofessor.com. <laughs> okay. okay, so please go over there. It's funny, okay? And, and go read the reviews. So what happens is that uh, she, she, she comes to me and screams at me, stop talking about me in your class. Because <laughs> people are over there, he, he doesn't teach. He just talks about his wife. Okay, So, <laughs> so yeah, so keep that in mind. Uh, so yeah, so that might happen. Uh, anyway, so yeah, so if, it's, if, I, if, it's, if I'm sick and I'm going to do it, it's fine. But if it's vacation, like it's a holiday and I do it, then I have to answer to the family. And that's not a good picture. Anything else? And believe me, half of the class won't come because they have families too, I believe. <laughs> All right. If you don't use if you don't use namespace.std, then this is what you need to do. All the C++ stuff should be std, and then std, not semicolon. Scope resolution. This is called scope resolution. So if I don't mention where he is, C out, that's what it is. Let me tell you quickly what namespaces are, OK? Because namespace is actually something new in C++. When I say new, I mean 20 years, OK? So uh, what? Oh, good. I have like six minutes. So. Uh, mm. You are writing a program or Seneca College to deal with students. And you are in the accounting department. When you look at a student, you are looking as an entity who has, who has OSAP loan, tuition fees, because it's the uh, uh, financial, what did I say? Which part I said? Which department I said? Accounting. accounting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so tuition and all the things, like one card's balance, things like that. That's what's important for you. So that's your student. And then I am writing a program at Seneca College, but I'm in the educational part. So for me, what's important is which semester students in, uh, how many subjects they pass, what is their GPA, uh, what are the prerequisites of their subjects, right? This is what, what, I, what I care about. So I don't care what is the balance of your one card. That has nothing to do with your OP244, correct? So if I want to create an object, a class, that identifies a student, what do I call it? A student. And I'm in the accounting department, right? The programmer who is in the educational section of Seneca wants to create a class that deals with a student. What should they call the student? A student. 
Now I have two classes with the same name. What am I supposed to do? Namespaces. So the accounting department writes all its code in accounting namespace, and the educational section of Seneca writes all its code into in the EDU, let's say, namespace. So if you want to create, so, so ACC namespace and EDU namespace. If you want to create a student for accounting purposes, you say ACC, scope resolution student. If you want to create a student for educational purposes, you write EDU, scope resolution student. If your application is mostly about education, you write using namespace education, EDU, so you don't have to keep writing EDU, 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 and so on and so forth. And if you put both namespaces using EDU and using accounting, then all the common aspects of the two should have the qualifier, the EDU and ACC, but the rest of them they don't need to. Very simple and straightforward. That's uh, namespace in a, in a nutshell. Okay, this class is actually much ahead for the other, the other class. The other class was locked too, I told you. The other class, I, I, I'm the only prof that goes in here, my classes are always locked for some, I have no idea why. <clears throat> and the other one, they actually, somebody actually had to come, we had to wait over there for 20 minutes. So this was quicker, so we went further over here. Uh, any other question? We may revisit all these things later on, but when you ask a question, I don't want to leave it blank, so I wanted to explain uh, how it works. We don't know the syntax for it, but we'll see how it works. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, all the, all the work that you are going to do in OOP244 will be under the namespace SDDS, the name of our school. SDDS. SDDS. So when you are writing a code in here, just for practice, you don't need to, but just for practice, we tell you all the code you are writing will be in namespace SDDS. All the main files will not have a namespace because it's using all the other namespaces. Okay? And one golden rule later on, for now, just listen to it. Don't, uh, you don't need to memorize it, just remember, not just, uh, be exposed to it. You, you, can, you are never allowed to use a namespace in a header file. In header file, you have to always scope resolute stuff. In a header file, you're not allowed to use any namespace. Can anybody tell me why? Because you can include the header file in five different places. So without knowing, you're going to start using namespaces, right? If you include a header file and somebody says using namespace ADU, then in your program, you are using namespaces ADU and you're not aware of it. So that's forbidden. You're not supposed You can, but it's a bad thing. It's like using break and continue. If I see in your workshop you are using break and continue, it's a resubmit. It works, but I don't want you to go back 20 years in programming, because that was abandoned 20 years ago. Now using break and continue. Break is only allowed to be used in switch statements and nowhere else. And continue is as if it doesn't exist. Do you know that C language C++ has a command called go to? You don't know? It does. It's essentially a continue with a label. And for some reason, people are still using continue. So yeah, that's that. <clears throat> are we good? Any other question? Any question one? Yes. Huh? Uh, Everything's in a lab. Nothing online. Oh, wow. okay. No quizzes online. Everything's in a lab. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I'll see what happens. If I see I, have, I am in lack of time, if I see that I, we, we did something in a lab, we don't have time, then I'll make it uh, offline. Not offline. Uh, online, but uh, not, not synchronous, asynchronous. But we'll see. I'd rather everything be synchronous. Are we good? So what, what's going to happen over here is this. I'm going to save this while you are packing your stuff. I'm going to close it. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to the, I'm going to go to the repository, as you see, 
And in here, I'm going to say right click, Cordis Git add. That's the add command for uh, Git. I'm going to click on OK. This is going to add. And in here, I'm going to say commit. It's going to say, what are you committing? And I'm going to say, hello app. <laughs> OK? So, and then in here, I'm going to say commit and push at the same time. Because I want to commit to this computer and immediately send it, I don't want to wait. If I was going to have lunch and come back, I would just say commit. OK? But if, if I'm done, I'm just going to say commit and push. And this is what happens. Oh, I have to pull first. See? Now, that's the intelligence. It says, hey, you changed something over there. First, bring the changes to your own computer. You may overwrite stuff. So now I'm going to say, sorry, first let me pull. So I'm going to pull. OK. And after I pulled, I'm going to push, uh, push again. And now it's successful. See? So now if I actually, if you actually go to the website, to the uh, yada, 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 right over here, if I refresh, you will see that NBB is there, NAA is there. As uh, directories are added, then you're going to see uh, it's not, you're not going to need subdirectories, subdirectories anymore. And you click over here, that's yours. And if you clone it, easy. You don't need to keep downloading. You simply go home on your computer and you say pull. It only brings the new stuff from my repository. So, because this is a read-only repository, careful. If you change stuff in it, nothing happens, actually. You can still pull. Yeah, you can still pull. Yeah, 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 you're not contributing. You can change stuff and keep pulling. But if you change something, and I change something do, if we both change something, you change something on your repository, I change the exact same file, on the main repository, then when you pull, it's going to give you a conflict. Remember that, okay? Which you have to resolve. You have to see what because the same source code was changed. Then you have to fix that conflict. It's a good thing. And if something like that happens, just delete the repository completely and re clone it again. <laughs> Easy for now, until you learn how to work with Git. Have yourself a beautiful day, everyone, and thank you very much.